All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing broadcast, podcast, broadcast and podcast. Today is July the 16th, 2017. Uh, our guest today is Livio Bohr. Hey, Livio. Hey, Mike. Great to, great to be on your show. It's a, it's a great honor. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, Livio is the co-creator, uh, one, th one of three co-creators, I believe, of the upcoming Gibbous game, Lovecraftian comedy horror game, which looks pretty interesting. Had a very successful Kickstarter that funded last year. So uh, why don't we do introductions and then we'll talk to Liv you. Why don't we start with Kelly and work our way over? Okay, I'm Kelly Young. I am the executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine, issue 21, available now at www.strange-eons.com. <laughs> Get a problem He's with that? You know. No, that was perfect. That's what I thought. Brilliant, in fact. Yes, uh, Matt. And Matt, Matt, will, Matt, tell the prize to you when you introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Matt Carpenter. I am editing a book called Hickman's Gallery. The top stories have been sent for review to the publisher, and I'm just waiting to hear back. Hopefully, we'll have announcements soon. Um, I do have a prize. I have a copy of a great book by one of the authors here called Reanimatrix. Uh, it's by that. Pete Rollick, his third book in the series. Um, except this one's really good because I've made amendments in the side and scratched things out that I didn't like. And I signed it as the corrected text. <laughs> nice. You, okay. you, you're saying you want an annotated guide to my works, so why don't you just do it? And correct. That's work. I, I just want to read it. You're a little staticky today, Matt. Oh, well. I'll, I'll we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to figure it out later. All right, Pete. I <laughs> am Pete Rollick, the author apparently of Animate, Reanimatrix, uh, Reanimator is the Weird Company. And, you know, I am, my sanity is hanging by a thin thread right now, but I do have another prize. Oh, good. All right, we'll so do two prizes. It's a little beat up, but I'm going to give away my copy of Clark Ashton Smith, The City of the Singing Flame. Okay. You know, so that is a great go. prize. Yeah, very cool. Did you make notes in the side, Pete? Uh, no, I did not. <laughs> oh, never mind. I don't want that one then. But it's got some uh, good stories in it. So, Rick. And I, Rick Lay, writer and fan of Doctor Who. <laughs> we can talk about Doctor Who later if you want. <laughs> um, okay, Liv, you. Um, what is Gibbous? Tell us a little bit about Gibbous. It, okay, it, so I talk, I talk about re uh, sure. Doctor Who just this second because it's sure. still blowing yeah. my mind. They announced the new Doctor, and my son tells my mom, "The new Doctor Who is a woman," and she says, "What in Game of Thrones?" I said, <laughs> "I'm revoking your nerd card." <laughs> <laughs> she had a tentative one. I'm revoking it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Gibbous, what's Gibbous? Okay, so Gibbous is, is what we call a comedy cosmic horror point and click adventure. And that might sound a little strange, but but I can I can totally I can totally explain it. So it's a it's a, it's a classically inspired point and click adventure like they used to make back in the nineties. Uh, like the kind that LucasArts used to make in Sierra. So it's it's sort of a niche genre nowadays. It's sort of died off, but it's something that we really, really have close to heart. And it was it was my way of combining uh, basically when you when you when you when you first make your creative your your first creative endeavor, you try you really have this tendency to combine things that you really, really love. So my thought was, is there a way that I can combine these kind of uh, maybe on the surface uh, goofy looking and very very cartoony point and click adventures with something as i don't know as completely different as lovecraftian influences and yeah. that's that's exactly what we set out to do and um 
it's about it's this game about this uh, this librarian who finds the Necronomicon and reads a spell from it and accidentally turns his cat into a talking abomination. And obviously cats being the way we know them to be, um, she hates being humanized because she considers it absolutely degrading and she just wants to go back to the Zen state of being a cat and being uh, taken care of. And, um, and she's, uh, the, she, she, she becomes uh, the very unwilling and sarcastic sidekick to the main character. And so their quest is to turn, um, turn the cat back to cathood. That's basically what sets everything um, off. And uh, so throughout the game, we run into some weird cults. And uh, yeah, it's it's very, very inspired by all of, by not, not all of, but like a multitude of Lovecraft's writings because I'm a, I'm a big fan. So lots and lots of references. It's the kind of game that you can't play I mean, it does have sense if you haven't read Lovecraft. You know, it's not the kind of it's not um, it's not the elitist or or it, it doesn't try to push away people that don't know about Lovecraft. But uh, if you are a fan, you're gonna really appreciate all the references. Yeah, so you don't necessarily have to be a Lovecraft fan, although I imagine most of the people listening are. But um, sure, it was it was very popular on Kickstarter, and I played. It's been a year now, I think, but I played the demo and really enjoyed it, especially the cat. <laughs> yeah, the cat is uh, very well done. yeah the cat the cat is everyone's favorite. Yeah, uh, what we tried to do so we're a very small studio, we're a three person studio, and what we tried to do was make up for the fact that we don't really have uh, we didn't really have a name, we don't really have any kind of connection, and we're from a we're from a place in the world that is not is not very famous for any kind of indie production or anything like that. We're from Transylvania, Romania. It's uh, famous for something else, yeah. Yeah, it is famous for something else. We're actually from a town that's 60 kilometers uh, away from where Vlad the Impaler was born. So, oh, really? Yeah, and that's another point. That's another interesting point about this project is that, you know, when you're making a Lovecraftian piece of media, whatever it is, of course, uh, everyone expects it to, to, to take place, like to, to happen in Lovecraft County, right? But I've never been to New England. I've never been to to America. And I really wanted this this project to be to feel very authentic. So what we're another interesting thing that we're doing is that um, instead of using uh, architect, you know, like New England architecture as an inspiration, I'm using the architecture and nature that I grew up around. You know, things that are very familiar to me. So I think that's a pretty interesting twist that we're we're putting on the on the on this kind of formula. That's, yeah, I uh, agree. I yeah. agree. So um, in a way, it's one of the most authentic, if not the most authentic Transylvanian games that, I mean, Transylvania related games, because it's actually being made here and inspired by the locations around us, you know? Yeah. Um, let's back up a little bit. How, how and when did you first get into Lovecraft? Oh, um, I think I was, yeah, I think I was around 15 or 16. No, uh, when I first read Lovecraft, but my actual first contact with Lovecraft, and I think that was the case with a lot of people, um, like tangential con uh, uh, contact, was watching uh, one of the Evil Dead movies and, <laughs> you know, the Necronomicon Ex Mortis. And then around, uh, when I was around 15 or 16, a friend lent me, I think it was Dagon and others, so I don't remember. It was like a, a very small, a very thin, um, paperback and I remember reading about the Necronomicon and and it was such an interesting impactful moment because it really really um, it really piqued my interest and I didn't have the internet back then and it was such a magical me moment because I started looking for more Lovecraftian stuff and the thing that you know like the leitmotif the, the theme that was uh, that was happening throughout Everything that I was, all the media that I was finding was the Necronomicon. And uh, I, I didn't really have access to the internet. So for a very small magical period there, I actually sort of suspected that the Necronomicon actually existed until I was <laughs> sadly proven wrong. But that was, that was a very, very beautiful moment. And I think that's one of the reasons that I really fell in love with Lovecraft. Sure. Time out. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying the Necronomicon? I had twelve different copies of it. <laughs> How could it not be real? Yeah, exactly. We actually addressed that in the game too. There you go. 
<laughs> yeah, it was, it, and yeah, and 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 this is one of the things that really attracted me uh, to to Lovecraft. I think it was a very ahead of his time thing that he was doing. You know, encouraging other other authors to 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 use his mythos and and like build on his characters and on his at, on the atmosphere that he was creating on his themes and everything. I think it was very very ahead of his time, and. The fact that we're making such a Lovecraft-inspired game is, I feel, is like we're we're also making like like paying a very humble tribute to to his to his very ahead of his time attitude, and it's like a it's like this tradition that we're we're sort of honoring. So yeah, we're we're super. I'm super super excited to be able to 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 make this game, and it uh, probably wouldn't be probably would not have been uh, uh, happening without uh, crowdfunding, which was was yeah. amazing for us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. And thank you guys. Uh, thank you and the Lovecraft Eason for, for, for plugging our Kickstarter back then. It really, really helped us. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, go ahead, Pete. So one of the things that I, I, I liked about the Kickstarter that you guys did was you actually did a pie chart that broke down expenses, which is yep. something that you don't see that often in Kickstarters, you know, and, and you made it very clear how much was going to go to production and how much is going to voices and how much actually Kickstarter was going to take from you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you're such a small team, you really, really need to, to do your homework on the finances and on preparing the campaign and everything like that. And it's really sad to see other projects that have like super promising projects that really don't do their homework on on Kickstarters. And actually, I've used my time this vacation to read uh, to to write a pretty lengthy lengthy three part guide to Kickstarting because I really want other really? indie devs to yeah yeah yeah. Um, it was recently published on Game of Sutra, which is a huge industry uh, game, uh, uh, like website, yeah. and it was featured too. So I really hope it helps other people because your game might be the best game ever, but if you don't know how to, how to, how to, I don't know, I don't know if it's actually marketing. I don't know if you, if you don't know how to communicate it, it's. Well, that's what you know, marketing is, isn't it? In a way, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess. I guess. Being able to communicate what you need and what you're trying to needs that you're trying to fill or desires that you're trying to fulfill in the co potential customer as well. Sure, sure. And and ours was a pretty tricky proposition, you know, because a lot of people when they hear comedy cosmic horror, they go, what? Like it's such an oxymoron, but but I don't know why we really hope that it that it works. Um, and well, we're not a this sure. on that. Let me let me just interrupt you real quick. I'm not a fan of most comedy horror. Uh, but I'm a fan of this game. I played the demo. I really, really enjoyed it. So it it works. What I've seen so far of this game, it does work. Thanks. Yeah, because uh, there's so many different ways of approaching, uh, you know, a comedic of, of having a comedic approach to to Lovecraft. And a lot of people go for uh, like for parodying, for example, the old ones. I actually made a small animated video about this, explaining how we want to approach. Uh, comedy and cosmic horror and basically what we're trying to do is not we, we don't want to make Cthulhu or the old ones cute we don't want to make them feel weak so that we achieve that comedic effect basically what we're doing is we're really gonna make a lot of fun of the humans and of the um, fish people and of the you know the lesser entities and n really not mess with the old ones that's our philosophy there. I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but basically that, that that's pretty much our philosophy there. Because I really, really don't want to take away from, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're doing such a, uh, I don't know, uh, risky, and uh, I, think it's, I think it's a pretty delicate thing to approach, you know, to, to, to use Love, Lovecraftian entities in, in your media, whatever it is, I think you really still need to be respectful a lot. You really need to treat them with, 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 with the respect that they deserve, even if you're uh, going for a comedic approach. And that's... that's and isn't that what a lot of Lovecraft fans really want to hear from you anyway, that you're going to be respectful of, of something that they revere? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. You have a very high creative output. I, I must say, this game, you uh, did the Kickstarter, what, paper or or um, 
whatever it yeah, was. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you did this video of a month in the life of creating this game. Exactly. Which was not only very well put together, it uh, was very informative as well. Why don't you talk a little bit about that video? Because you're very candid in there. Um, and I want you to talk about your your two co-creators as well, because all three of you are in the video. Um, you know, I remember there's this one scene where uh, Kami was very, very upset because of the, there's a lot of pressure to get this done and everything. And I thought it would just be very easy to not include that. But yep. it was a good choice that you did include it. Yeah, I think it was a good choice too. Uh, the thing is that the moment we went to Kickstarter, the moment we went to crowdfunding and basically asked for people mo people's money in advance to be able to make this game, we we set out to be 100% transparent. So come hell or high water, and no matter how it went, we, we really wanted to show everything and and be as transparent as possible, and that's a philosophy that we that we've uh, you know that we, we've stuck out with uh, throughout making the game, um, and it's it sort of becomes second nature. For example, we we stream every single day uh, um, everything that we work on the game. We live stream it on Twitch, whether it's art or animation or uh, programming. Even our programmer Nico streams uh, five five days a week, and sometimes we stream playing other games. Sometimes, I mean, most of the times, at least five days out of seven days, we are in constant contact with our backers. So it made a lot of sense to to give something back to them. You know, it was our one year uh, from the Kickstarter anniversary. We really, really felt like like we needed, like we really wanted to do something extra for the backers. And we had no kind of budget. Everything was filmed on a, um, with a GoPro, uh, which is very frustrating if you're a visual person because you can't really see what you're filming. So uh, every night after working 10 or 12 hours on the day, on the, on the game, I had to um, edit the footage and I would just facepalm whenever I saw that. I didn't, I didn't frame people in the shot. However, I i mean, it, it was just a, f a frustrating, but ultimately a very rewarding experience. And I think people really, really appreciated our our honesty. And look, working on, yeah. on an indie game is very, very intensive. Um, Fortunately, we're in Eastern Europe, so fifty the fifty around fifty six thousand dollars. That's how much we managed to raise on Kickstarter. That goes uh, that goes a bit of a longer way here in Eastern Europe, where life is a bit cheaper. But uh, either way, it's 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 very you really need to you really need to put that money to the best use possible, and that means working a lot. But you know, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining because it's it's been the best time of my life ever since. Ever no, since. it's not coming off that way at all. No, it is. It's 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 actually the other way around. I need to. We we actually all three of us. We need to try and stop ourselves from pushing ourselves a bit too hard because it can take its toll. And when when Kami, uh, you know, became very emotional during our our documentary, that's that's pretty much the effect of. Um, yeah, just working really, really hard on something, being very passionate, and and that's the effect of really, really caring about your product and really hoping that it's it's going to have an impact. Because ultimately, you're not we're not making this for ourselves. We really want it to have an audience, and we really want it to be well well received. Oh, well, your your passion really for this project really shows and comes through, and uh, I'm sure all of your Kickstarter followers feel the same way, as transparent as you've been. Um, talk a little bit about Kami and what's the what's your other co-creator's name? Uh, yeah, uh, Kami and Nico. I'm sorry. I, yeah. Uh, we were basically an animation, sort of an animation studio before we were making music videos, but really all of all three, all our passion, I mean, our common passions were, were video games. Uh, and uh, that's how we were basically working in the same. We're we're part of we were part of a bigger IT company. Nick was just a programmer. Me and Kami were animators, and uh, one day Nick came and showed us that he could, like he showed us a little demo that he that he made in in, in Unity, and uh, and that's how that's how the idea for for this uh, for this game was sparked. And and we're very very different people with very different personalities, but. We clicked together so well, and I don't know. It I would not be making this game with anybody else at this at this point. Um, it's it's amazing how much 
how much creative output three people can have um, if there is that chemistry there, if there's that chemistry there. And it's super right. important to be able to, to, to just work together for hours and hours on end and, and you know, not, not get on each other's nerves too much and understand each other. And it's, it's just a very rewarding, uh, just a very, very rewarding experience. So he's the programmer. And yep. What's your job and what's Kimi's job? Yeah, so great. Uh, I'm the, well, we have to wear a lot of, of hats given the fact that right, right. it's the three yep. person operation. So uh, Kami is a, uh, uh, an artist, an animator, uh, and a composer. And I am the lead on the project. I do the writing, the uh, game design, music composing, animating, drawing the backgrounds, um, and some voice work probably. <laughs> So yeah, it's uh, we really have to wear lots and lots of hats, and there is no aspect that is more important than the other one. And this this project would be absolutely impossible to pull off if even just one of us was taken out of the equation. So I think it's it's we're really running like a well-oiled machine, well-oiled machine, and I'm really really happy happy about it. What kinds that you do as you know. As much as one can tell from watching the videos and so forth, you do come off that way, like you're you're meshing really well together. Um, that said, what kind of problems have you run into so far, not with each other, but in creating the game, and what have you done about them? Yeah, um, there is just one pretty big, um, I'd call it like a, an honest mistake that we've made, and that is that when we when we when we started our Kickstarter campaign, we really had had I had a very general idea of the plot and of the um, of the scope, but we were pretty overfunded by the end of the campaign. We only asked for forty thousand dollars, and it it came up to fifty six thousand dollars. And of course, what you want to do is take advantage of that extra money and and try and increase the scope and try and make a better and bigger game. So. What I would have changed about it, about uh, the campaign and, and about the project is I would have uh, I would have not put a one year delivery uh, you know uh, deadline on it. Now a lot of actually not right. a lot. I think I think it's a I think it's a it's actually an exception if people actually deliver on on their promise on their Kickstarter campaign exactly when they say it because it's always like at least a year late. So I really wish that would not have been us. But again, it, this was pretty much solved by the fact that we were very, very transparent about this with the backers and we asked them in an update. We were like, I, like I'm an animator I, and an artist. I love being able to put extra characters in the, in, the, in the game, make the game world feel a lot more believable. And so we, we, what we did was we asked our backers and we said, okay, this is what we want to do. We want to expand the scope. Are you cool with, with waiting a bit more? Uh, is it all right if we want to make a, if you want this to be a bigger and a better game? And thankfully the answer was yes. And we could not have nicer people behind us, you know, and, and, and that's a very, very important. That's, that's our biggest motivation so far that all of our, like with no except, with absolutely no exception, all our interactions with our backers were just positive, and and they were just cheering us along, and that's it's, it's a very 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 awesome feeling. So and people will also forgive a lot, you know, what you call your honest mistake there. If if you are being transparent, if you are communicating with them, absolutely, they know what's going on. And it's you it's very, yeah, and it it is important that. Uh, you know, all this extra time has translated into a lot more impressive graphics or VFX, and it's really important that you keep your backers in in the loop and show them like, okay, look, we're taking a little bit longer, but look how cool this looks, and people are like, yes, okay, that's time put to 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 very good use, and it's also helpful that we're from a very very small town and nothing really happens here. So, so, you know, you're not, you don't really feel like you're missing out on anything. You know, it'd be, it'd be like a summer evening and you think maybe something's happening in town. I could, no, nothing's happening. I could just spend a couple more hours in the office and polish this and add an extra that. And I know what you mean. I live in a t small town as well. 
<laughs> but, but isn't that the joy of being collect connected electronically worldwide in that you can plop yourself out in the middle of nowhere absolutely small team produce something and then distribute it worldwide relatively easy absolutely it's it's yeah. it's absolutely incredible and just the fact just the thought that so many people from around the world can come together and help you make your dream come true is just absolutely incredible because otherwise you know what chance would we have had from a small eastern european country not a chance in the world you know so we're very i for one am very very grateful to technology and the internet and i think it's, it's the greatest thing ever well, fun and fundraisers like kickstarter have really leveled the playing field you know absolutely you don't have to be a big gaming company to do something like this exactly absolutely and for for some reason, Lovecraftian things are really really popular on Kickstarter. I don't know if you yes, noticed that. I did. I've done a Kickstarter. <laughs> oh yeah. One. Yeah, for a, for a book uh, about the same time you did, a little bit a little bit earlier, I think maybe. Cool. But yes, it is yeah. very popular. I, I need to ask uh, just a couple questions. I'm not trying to be a stick in the mud. When nope. do you think it'll be ready to be sold to the general public? Uh. Yeah, that's a pretty difficult question. Um, there are a couple of issues. We really hope to get it done by the end of the year. We really hope that's what we're gunning for. We're really pushing hard to get it done by the end of the year. Uh, the problem with that is that releasing a game, I mean, getting a game done is not necessarily the same thing about releasing uh, with releasing a game. Because sure. November and December are crazy months to release a game, for example, because there's all the big AAA titles that eat up everybody's video game um, budgets, and you might just mess up your launch if you do that. So it's it's hard to tell. I I am really hoping at, at the latest, um, I don't know, late, we're, we're, we're really gunning for, for late 2017. Okay, and then now this is just me being selfish, I run on Mac. Sure. Is, it gonna, is there going to be able to a platform that supports doing the game on Mac, or do I have to have a Windows machine? No, absolutely. We're 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 uh, developing for Mac, PC, and Linux from the get go. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. Um, not that I yeah. not that I've got ulterior motives for wanting to know when you're going to release. You know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of small companies, the answer would be no, though, uh, with you. You know? Yeah, I know, I know, but but we really we really wanted to 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 have we really wanted this game, even though it's sort of a niche genre nowadays. We really wanted to have, uh, you know, not deny it to to people on Macs or on on Linuxes. We we really wanted to have we wanted it to have a big a big as big as an, an audience as as possible. Um, can you talk about the art, the type of art that you're using in the game? Sure. Um, yeah, we're um, everything in the game. Every everything that is visual in the game is handcrafted. We really wanted that to. to we we're making a point out of that. So uh, we have lots and lots of backgrounds in the game. Everything is hand painted, and it takes a lot of time. Even though we do everything digitally, that's still a lot of work. You know, we're just a couple of artists. And for example, I'm the only one working on the background art. It will take me anywhere from. 10 to 12 hours to maybe 50 or 60 hours for just one background of um, so it's very very laborious and time-consuming uh, work but it's very very rewarding and I really you don't necessarily have to do this a lot of a lot of games don't do this but I feel it's very important especially since it's a point-and-click adventure and it's not it's not one of those action games where everything goes by really fast. You know, you really take your time and walk around these environments. It's like walking around. Uh, I've always compared this to walking around in, like, it's a, it's a, it's an art gallery, but you're walking around in it. So you want to have a lot of detail. You want to, you want to reward the player with a lot of detail. And uh, other than that, we're using frame by frame animation, uh, just like the traditional, uh, tr just like traditional animation. It's just that we're making, we're doing that digitally. That means a lot of work too. People who have been watching our animations at like uh, it takes 76 I think different drawings for one second of animation. So that's a lot of work. Uh, yeah. That's yeah that's 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 the kind of stuff that maybe you know studios with 10 or 12 or 30 or 50 people might take on. We took it on in you know as as a three-person studio and only two animators. So 
that's the reason that we're spending lots of late nights at the office in front of the in front of the graphic tablets. So you have to love what you do to do that. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely do. But everything about this project is that's the great uh, again one another another great thing about Kickstarter is that people just trust your creative vision. There are no there's no one coming in and telling you don't do this or don't add that or it's it's pure it's your pure vision that can come come through exactly how you want it and that's amazing and for this being our first i think we're very very fortunate because we're not in the industry we didn't have to work on bigger um in bigger companies being small cogs in a machine we can just be 100 percent creative and i think it's really going to show when the game's going to launch as a follow-up to matt's question i know this isn't uh foreseen right now maybe but it, do you first see later in the future for Android Sorry. or or oh yeah absolutely um, that's the that's one of the the advantages of point and click adventure they translate really really well to mobile devices because all you right. do is tap around there's no action there's no there's just a lot of thinking and a lot of tapping so there's definitely something that we want to do uh, but they're probably going to be um, maybe we we have to figure out the technical aspects because we are going to have uh, the voice acting acting in this in this game is crazy. There's going to be tens of thousands of re recorded uh, lines of dialogue, and uh, so many different ac accents. I am very excited about all the different accents because, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, a pretty big chunk of the game is taking place in Transylvania right here, and we're going to use local actors. I'm really excited about that. Finally, authentic Transylvanian accents, not what you're getting in the movies, like the real deal. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to figure out how to do that, uh, how to pull that off on a technical on the technical side. But we definitely want to have uh, want to release on as many platforms as possible. And and adventure games are a very good fit for for mobile devices. Um, if someone's listening to this and they they're thinking, wow, this sounds really cool, but they weren't part of the Kickstarter, um, do you know yet how much the game will be, or do you have any idea? How much it will be, and, and I assume it'll be on Steam. Yeah, it'll definitely be on Steam. We've already been uh, greenlit during the Kickstarter campaign. Um, well, it's pretty hard to tell right now, but I have a pretty general idea. It's hard to tell because we don't really know which way, which route we're going to take. The the simple fact that we're independent doesn't mean that we necessarily don't want to get a publisher on board. We just don't want to get a publisher on board as long as we're producing the game because we want 100% creative freedom. So it's pretty hard to tell, but uh, I think as a general prediction, it will be probably either uh, $15 or $19, some, somewhere around that, because that's pretty much, uh, there are like a few categories of, of, of pricing for indie games, and I think we could we could easily go for either one of these because you know the 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 production value is there. So yeah, I think that's 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 just a prediction, but probably anywhere uh, either either one of these probably fifteen or nineteen dollars. That's pretty much it. And um, and if they're interested, if there's anyone that's interested in checking out the game, they can go to www.gibbusgame.com. And uh, the demo is still available. It's a pretty hefty demo. I think it, you can get something like 30 or 40 or even more minutes of gameplay out of it. It's, it used to be a vertical slice in the sense that it used to represent what the game was going to look like. Now it's looking even better. So it's not really representative of the final quality of the game, but I think it's, we're still pretty happy with it. It's, a, it's, uh, it's there for everyone to download and, and, uh, and check out. And, uh, hopefully get excited about. Is that where everyone goes to look at the streaming daily streaming videos as well? Um, no, actually we have a, a Twitch channel. Um, and yeah, actually I should, now that you say that, I should, I should probably integrate that into the website. Link uh, to it at least, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should, we should do that. Um, it's, it's really hard to keep up with all this promotional kind of stuff because, you yeah. know, just being just three persons on the team, you, you have to, you have to, you're, you're constantly putting out fires left and right. So things like this escape us, but that's, they can oh, it's watch. It's amazing what just the three of you guys are doing uh, yeah. by yourself. Truly incredible. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's really, it really comes very, very naturally when you, when you have a hundred percent creative freedom, you know, and, um, 
uh, yeah, it's something that you really learn to appreciate if you if you've done client work before, you know, because just being able to 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 do exactly the best thing, like the best thing that you know for the project, and not having anyone tell you differently because you are the lead on it, is is amazing. So yeah, and going back to the to the streaming thing, uh, our stream uh, address is twitch.tv slash Gibbous Game. And if you're curious about how one goes, I mean, not one, but three people go around making an indie game, you can tune in every day for at least a couple of hours, and we show everything. So from from drawing to animating to music production to putting the game together to programming and uh, plus our bi-weekly sessions of just talking to, to our backers about the game and informing them about how stuff is going. We just really we just really enjoy this like global connection with our audience and we it's it's something that we 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 care deeply about. So switch excuse me switch.tv slash uh, twitch twitch, twitch. I'm sorry. twitch yeah I just bought twitch. my son a switch so it's on my it's in my brain. <laughs> Oh, I want one of those too. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah, it really is. It, uh, yeah, the thing, the thing when when you're starting to work on your own game, the one of the saddest things that happens is that you don't have time to play other games anymore, and it also really cuts into your reading time. So, so unfortunately, I. I I have to to resort to only looking for audiobooks so that I can lis listen to to stuff while I'm while I'm drawing so you know uh there are a lot of trade-offs but yeah the <laughs> so I like background noise while I write so I usually put on something on Netflix but lately the problem I've been having is that Netflix is putting up a whole lot of foreign movies not English <laughs> and they're subtitling them. And then I get sucked in because I can't write and read at the same time. Uh -huh. So like the productivity goes down because there's good foreign films on Netflix right now. Sure. And but yeah, go ahead. But can you can you can you write and listen to to stuff at the same time? Wow, so that when I start writing, I start amazing. writing in a bar. And now, if I'm going to produce, I need that sort of bar background noise. That's and super, super interesting. Yeah, that is very interesting because I'm I'm completely the opposite. If I hear yeah. and I I only listen to, I guess that's most people. We only I can only listen to instrumental music if I'm if I'm writing and uh, and yeah, it's it, working on an adventure game is a lot, lots and lots of writing, lots and lots of dialogue. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm with you, Olivia. I, that's the only thing I can ever listen to when I'm working is instrumental music. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm fortunate in that in that I have I can sometimes uh, you know if I'm if I'm doing animation which is pretty repetitive I can listen to an audiobook or or a podcast if I'm doing art, but if I if I write I really need either silence or or instrumental music. Yeah. What are some of your favorite video games? By the way, um, some of my favorite video games. Well, to mention a very good Lovecraftian one, uh, I would definitely mention Call of Cthulhu: Dark Corners of the Earth. It's. I was just thinking to myself, I wonder if he's going to mention Dark Corners. Oh, of the Earth. <laughs> I think it's the best Love, uh, Lovecraftian adaptation uh, in in the video games uh, genre, yeah, and it's it. Very good. I feel like it only goes down a little bit when you get the chance to fight back. So um, I don't know the action sequences. I'm not that crazy about, but that's the crazy thing. The 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 the, the awesome thing about that game is that they managed to to portray Innsmouth exactly the way I, I imagined it when I when I read the the novella, and uh, and it's my favorite work of um, it is my favorite work of uh, of Lovecraft and uh, plays a pretty big part. It's a huge inspiration on our game, too. Um, but we did. I did change. I did change the name from uh, in our game from uh, from Innsmouth to Fishmouth because uh, I am still very much in the dark about the legality of, of using Lovecraft uh, uh, trade trade. I mean, uh, copyright, possibly copyrighted uh, uh, 
uh, names and and locations and stuff. So that's that's the reason that we're we we have Darkham in the game, not Arkham, and Fishmouth instead of Innsmouth. I don't know. It's a very big blur for me, and I just wanted to be on the on the safe side. Yeah, I think you're okay, but it doesn't hurt to be on the safe side. And Fishmouth is more comedic than Innsmouth. yeah, it is. That's that's <laughs> that's another reason for that. But you know, I'm not. I don't have any kind of legal background, and I. I started researching that kind of stuff, but it's crazy. It also differs from the EU to, to the US. And uh, I don't know, I, I just wish at some point someone really, uh, you know, made that a lot clearer for, for us laymen just to, to know, because I know what, what Lovecraft, I, like I'm, I'm convinced that Lovecraft would have been all right with people to, to, to further his, his universe and his mythos. It's just that, it's a. Uh, it can be risky, you know. So, and we're making a product that we're selling. So, I want it, really want it to be on the safe side, yeah. So, what are some of your other favorite video games? Uh, so, my other favorite video games. Well, I really love point and click adventures. That's why I'm uh, making one. I love uh, Day of the Tentacle, uh, especially the the Lucas Arts ones. I love uh, Grim Fandango. Um, Curse of Monkey Island is a huge inspiration, huge visual inspiration. A lot of people that saw our game uh, are like, oh, you're a Bill Tiller fan. And I'm like, yes, I am a very big, big Tiller fan. Um, what else? I've been starting to play Dark Souls 3. I bought it. I, I don't really have time to play it. And I realized that I really, really suck at it. But I love the <laughs> atmosphere. <laughs> really love the atmosphere. I like Bloodborne, which is also pretty Lovecraftian. I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, great game, but they're very difficult and they require a lot of time to be put in, uh, into them. So it's, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem for me. And, uh, and other than that, oh, yeah, keeping in tone with the, with the Lovecraftian kind of thing, uh, uh, Quake 1 is one of my, one of my favorite uh, games. And I had no idea it was that Lovecraft-inspired until I actually started reading Lovecraft. And... And realizing that, so, so there's a red thread going on through, through all these all this media that I that I enjoy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favorite Lovecraft story then? Speaking of that thread, <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely I have two. I mean, all of them are incredible, but I have two. One is uh, one is the Shadow over, over Innsmouth, which I can read and reread and listen to for an indefinite I don't think I'll ever get get uh, get sick of it or stop reading it at least twice a year and uh, my other one is Charles Dexter Ward which incidentally has the I think it's the only reference to Transylvania and I might be wrong about that but that is there's definitely a reference to Transylvania uh, in it and there's a very very small piece of plot there that is I don't know it's very glossed over in uh, in the in the work itself, and I chose to take that very small piece of plot that actually happens in Transylvania and expand on it in our game. So I'm very very excited about that. It was it was a little snippet of of text that uh, that I'm very excited that I could just take and expand on and uh, you know just locate it around here where we live. It's really exciting. Oh, good. You said you could uh, read Shadow Over Ensmith over and over. Um, yep. Have you listened to the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society's audio drama of that? I am sure that I've, I think I've listened to everything that was available. Oh, yeah, 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 good. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I know which, stuff. yeah, I think I know which one you mean. Yes, yes. Great, great, great stuff. And it's also, but it, but it becomes a challenge when you, when you also need to start looking for your own voice actors, you know, that, that will, if, if you have a very, if you have parts of the game like we do, which are very inspired by the, by the work, you know, it, it really becomes a challenge finding, you really want to find actors that can live up to that kind of awesome dramatization. So, yeah. Uh, is there anything that I've, I've missed that you would like to talk about? A question that I didn't ask that you think the listeners would like to know about um i don't know like um just just uh, talking about video games and lovecraft in in general 
I just feel like we made uh, not to doubt my our own horn, but toot. Oh, is, that's toot, right? I don't know. <laughs> toot. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah not yeah. to toot our own horn, but I think we made a very uh, good choice uh, genre wise to to go for point and click adventure. It wasn't necessarily an intentional thing because I always wanted to make a, a point and click adventure, but I think it's the genre that that works best for for Lovecrafting and stuff, and that's an interesting. That's an interesting uh, thing to 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 consider, you know, video games and uh, and cosmic horror because a lot of video games. I'm not trying to put them down, but a lot of video games are all about action and shooting and fighting back. And I noticed that the the genres that where where Lovecraftian influences work best are the ones where are the ones that are a lot less action oriented and a lot you know a lot more story oriented. And a lot, right. yeah, where atmosphere. The mood, the atmosphere as opposed to action. Absolutely. And, yeah, and I, I noticed that about me. I'm, um, I'm personally, I am a very uh, positive and optimistic person. So I don't necessarily uh, relate to, to, like, to Lovecraft's uh, cynicism or, you know, nihilism. But what I am into his work for is definitely the atmosphere and the world building. So it's very, very exciting to be able to make and not to not not just to build a world, but an interactive world and try and uh, not necessarily reproduce reproduce that atmosphere, but like pass it through your own filter and you know put a put your own personal twist on it. It's it's a very exciting thing that that you know for a creator uh, to do. I'm I'm just really really excited about that. So. Um, yeah, I think we made a pretty. I think we made a pretty good choice, and people seem to be excited. People seem to be excited about the game. They responded well to the to the Kickstarter campaign. I don't know. It's just a very humbling and mind blowing experience for us because uh, we are basically nobodies from the middle of nowhere, and we're making this thing, and then we couldn't be more more happy that people seem to 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 enjoy it. That's great. I think actually, yeah, don't, don't say that you're nobody's from the middle of nowhere. In the U.S., we are stuck because people only really have the English language. We're not very good at multiple languages like they are in Europe. It's We're not brought up that way. We are missing out on a plethora of Lovecraftian fiction, I'm sure, <laughs> in the original Italian, Spanish, French, Russian, you name it. It's more like you're giving us a window into a world we want a bigger window into. So so please just don't say that. It's like <laughs> we are we are missing out on a lot of the European experience of Lovecraftian fiction. We've often spoke that we would love if there was some enterprising wealthy person who wanted something to do, that they could open up a company and provide English translations of the best European Lovecraftian fiction. And that stuff I know I would snap that up in an instant. So that's an interesting point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Since since you mentioned uh, Transylvania in Lovecraft, did you sure. ever read The Black Stone by Robert E. Howard? No, I haven't. Uh, you might like that. That's uh, by Lovecraft's correspondent. It, uh, it's probably the only Cthulhu mythos story by the, by the original Lovecraft circle writers that is totally set in Transylvania. Oh, it's totally set. Okay. Now now I really want to read it. <laughs> it's very readily available on the internet. Cool. I will I will look it up. Whenever whenever I come across Transylvania related media, it's 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 either very exciting and engaging or very funny to us. If you, know? uh, you read you probably read the thing on the doorstep by Lovecraft. Oh absolutely yeah. Well, you may remember there's a reference in the like opening paragraph or so to some poet who died after visiting Transylvania. Oh, and that's what the that was a reference to the Black Stone. Oh, cool, cool. Any other questions for Livio, you, you guys? Yeah, Livio, since we're talking about Transylvania, can you tell us a little bit about 
modern day Transylvania? Because I know that last year, I think it was rated the number one tourist destination in the world. Are they really capitalizing on the Dracula thing? And what's it like living there while all of these people are coming and trampling all over this gorgeous old city? Uh, unfortunately, they are not capitalizing on it. And and it's, it's a very, it's a very sad, sad thing. Uh, first of all, it's a very, it's, it's, it's strange to think that this area of Romania is famous because some Irish dude who never actually set foot here wrote this. Well, it, it is a ridiculous, I mean, it is a ridiculous <laughs> portrayal of the land because it has really not much to do with the, I mean, he did, he did do his research. Uh, he he actually um, he actually described the uh, Dracula's castle. Uh, I think it was according to um, I mean he he looked up photographs of Bran Castle. So there there was some kind of there was some kind of realism there. But to answer your question, no, we're not really doing a lot about that. Not I mean if if this were the U.S., there probably would have been some kind of big park or amusement park or some way absolutely. to yeah absolutely so we're not really doing a lot about that i'm, I'm kind of sad you know i'm really kind of sad but other than that yeah it's a very very beautiful place but there's 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 this dichotomy between the ancient buildings and uh the 80s 70s and 80s communist built um you know apartment buildings like the one that i live in uh, which are uh, pretty depressed. So it's a land of contrast. That I can tell you that it's a land of contrast. But the the I think we have one of the the Sigishwara, that place that I was telling you about, where Vlad Tsepesh was born, Vlad the Impaler. Uh, I think it's one of the oldest uh, actually lived in citadels, and they're really really beautiful, really beautiful places. Um, it's 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 it is a very beautiful place to visit. The infrastructure is not so great. It's pretty difficult to reach, but hey, that's Transylvania. It's supposed to be difficult to reach. Not in 2017, but you know, keeping in with traditions. <laughs> well, it, aren't most of the uh, tourist spots associated with the historical Dracula in neighboring Wallachia? Uh, if they're neighboring Wallachia? No, I'm just saying most most of the yeah, glad the impalers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he was actually, yeah, he was actually a Valachian uh, ruler. Well, it's. I mean, that's a relative thing because it's a pretty small country. You can drive. We can pretty much drive between them within like a couple of hours. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. That close. Yes, and and you know the the, the castle that is uh, presented as Dracula's castle. I mean, Vlad the Impaler's castle didn't really have that much to do with him but you know there, there's a lot of discrepancies uh interesting thing if you go inside dracula's castle the there are posters on the wall and um the vampire pictures there are taken from the the lost boys movie so <laughs> <laughs> really yeah we went there with an american friend recently who was very 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 amused by that um <laughs> uh but yeah Beautiful place, beautiful place to to visit, in my opinion. So, if you guys have the chance to come over, it's definitely worth worth the trip. Is, is there any um, story of, of vampires in Transylvania that are, are classics in uh, Romania? Not really. We, I mean, as far as I know, we have some. I mean. If, if, Local folklore pretty much deals with the, the closest thing to that is some kind of ghoul, right? But vampires per se, not really. The fang and the cape kind of thing, um, not really. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw some documentary once which said that in, in Transylvanian folklore, the fangs are, are different. They're more like one of the top tooth and one of the bottom tooth, and the bite is. The fight is asymmetrical. <laughs> well, there are very, there were, I remember reading that there were very isolated, uh, uh, very backwards uh, villages where if you, like where villagers suspected that so-and-so didn't uh, die properly, so they would dig him up and uh, burn their heart and eat it. This actually happened within my lifetime, but we were, 
as a community just as uh, repulsed by that as you would imagine so it's it's not really a thing that we do here but i mean i mean i guess it did i guess it did happen at least at least once and i know that we I know that we really squandered a huge marketing marketing opportunity not making a vampire game out of Transylvania because that I guess that would have made a lot more sense but I'm really a lot more into uh, amorphous blobs and things that haven't been fed for 50 years and are screaming at the bottom of bottoms of bits so what can I say we did we did use the the Transylvania twist uh, on it and and, and there is parts of the game taking place in Transylvania so it's not a complete marketing loss there. So it's www.gibbusgame.com and the, the live streams, what Monday through Friday, I'm assuming, um, yep. are uh, twitch.tv slash gibbus, right? Slash gibbus game. Slash gibbus games. Twitch.tv slash gibbus game. Gibbous game. And, uh, also, twitter.com slash gibbous game, pretty much uh, everywhere uh, gibbous game. If you if you Google gibbous, there are, that's, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to run across our our game. I really like that. Uh, it's one of those, I, I, I call the game gibbous. Uh, to be honest, I, I wanted to call it gibbous before I knew what it was going to be about because it's one of my favorite, one of, one of those words, one of those Lovecraftian words. But looking into it, I, I initially had no idea that it also, it, it, it didn't just refer to the moon phase, but it also meant uh, um, not completely revealed, partially revealed. And that tied very nicely into some uh, plot elements. And I, I'm, I'm very happy that we, we, stuck, we stuck with, the, with that uh, title. I'm really, I can't wait to unleash this game on the unsuspecting world. That's all I can say. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to play more of it. So thanks for being on the show, Livio. Really great talking with you. Thank you so much, Mike and, and, and everyone. It, it, is an, uh, it is an honor. Nice to meet you, Livio. Nice, 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 to nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you all. Have a good night. I know it's late there. Yeah, it's uh, 2 a.m. And in about five or six hours, I want to I wanna get up and start working on the game. Well, so, we, better, we better let you go. <laughs> All right, uh, you guys have fun, and it's it's been great. It's been great meeting everyone, and again, it's it's been an an honor. Thank you again for having me. Yep. Thanks again. Have a good night. Bye bye, everyone. So uh, that really looks like a fun game. Yeah. What I, I played the demo, as I said, and it enjoyable. Jelly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, you, you froze up on me. What happened? Oh, I'm sorry. You, you said that George Romero has died. Yeah, George Romero has died. Oh. Yeah, bummer. Lung cancer. Uh, that's not good. Um, Scott Thomas, the author of *The Sea of Ash* and several other books and many short stories. Uh, I think probably anybody listening to this has probably heard me mention the Sea of Ash since I published it and hopefully read it because it's one of the finest. It's what got me started in the publishing books business because I wanted to get this out to a wider audience. Uh, just a hell of a great novella. Um, and it's on audible.com as well. But anyway, Scott's having some money troubles. Let's put it that way. He goes into detail on his GoFundMe page. Uh, you, you know, if you got three or five bucks, it, even it, any little bit would help him out. Um, this is a guy that, frankly, I wish it, if, if, if this was a fair world, you know, every every reader would know his name because he's that good. Yeah. Yeah, um, and he's not asking for a lot of money. He's just trying to raise enough money no. to get this car. Right. Right. Otherwise, they're not in a good uh, place if they don't get it. Right. Um, you can't really Google Scott Thomas and GoFundMe because I tried, um, but I did put the link in the uh, show show description here, so uh, you can click right over to it from there. So please help him out if you can. Um, 
I've ever mentioned the GoFundMe on this show before, but you know, I just think uh, he deserves it. So he deserves a mention and some help if you can give it to him. Um, okay, what else do we have to talk about? Um, Kelly, you said The Void's on Netflix now, right? What did you think of that movie again? I I liked it fine. I didn't love it. Um, I don't think it's going to be remembered favorably. Um, it's mostly good practical effects, pretty poor acting, a so-so script. But um, it does really make me want to see what these guys do next. I've, I've watched it three times. And I would like to see what they could do with a real budget and with some real actors. Yeah. Um, and perhaps... A, a, one of the complaints I've seen is that the the doctor steals the show and he talks a whole hell of a lot. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I started to watch it. I, what, 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 was the doctor the actor from Twin Peaks who played the crazy yes. guy? Earl yeah. Wyndham? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's all I want. How the hell do I remember that? <laughs> <laughs> speaking speaking of that, I was telling Mike that I had listened to your guys' uh, podcast, the Patreon podcast of the two oh, of you yeah. talking, and my brain uh, just overfilled and spilled out my ears. There was so much information going on there, and I was just like, how do these guys know this stuff? <laughs> Not only how did you learn it, but how did you retain that? It seems like everything I hear just is in one ear and out the other. I, I took, well, because I was doing research on that issue for a story, and, you know, you get into this research mode, and it's like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, cool, and then the next thing you know, you're finding out all this stuff, and it's like, where's my handy guide to the cult of Sabelle and Addis, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, so it's like, and it doesn't exist, right, so, you know, you have to write it. And I even left stuff out of that conversation. Well, then, I got to say, if you're a Patreon member and you haven't listened to it, you should go and download it. And if you're not a Patreon member, well, you're missing out. Well, I, I think it's also, we can also retain, it's like, uh, I've mentioned this to Joe. I can remember things by Lovecraft, and if I read some story that predated Lovecraft that I think influenced it, I'll remember that. But I have a problem remembering all these wonderful stories by Laird Barron. Just that it's new stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, I told Kelly that I did not even feel qualified to ask a follow-up question. You know, do anything more than smile and nod. You know, that was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. My favorite was Rick said something like, Here's where it gets complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait, wait. Uh, Pete. Oh. I'm sorry, I missed yeah. that again. I said, here it gets complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Here? here now? Jeez. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, if you're not a Patreon member, this is just one of the many benefits. It doesn't cost much. Uh, you can Google Patreon and uh, Lovecraft Easing. I've got the link in the show description, too. And I know I, I derailed as we were talking about The Void, but then yeah. tangentially related on Netflix is uh, Glow, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling, which has a... How is that related? <laughs> it's got which Cody has a, a Lovecraftian... The Cody Goodfellow. Cody Goodfellow plays a homeless guy in the audience of one of the matches. <laughs> Typecasting. So Typecasting. Is he playing a part or did he just wander on I, I wanted to text him and say, did you even know you were in an episode of a television show or did you just wake up there and they were filming you? <laughs> <laughs> Here, fill out this this form. So it, it, yeah, permission he me. should have improvised and done some water bubbles. <laughs> Something. <laughs> so does anybody else besides me actually remember when Glow was a real thing? Yeah, I, I do. Oh. I do not, but after watching the show, I wish I did. I wonder if any of that stuff is available to watch. And is, I, should we even be talking about this? I know this has nothing to do with horror or Lovecraft or anything, but uh, well, when, I, I love. 
That's true. I loved the show, and I'm curious, were these characters on the show the actual people who were wrestling? I mean, were those characters the American woman and whatever? I'd have to go back and look. I didn't – I haven't looked yet. Okay. I haven't watched the show. I'm still trying to catch up on, like, my stories. So, yeah. yeah. You're still trying to catch up on your stories? Does that mean you're soap <laughs> opera? <laughs> so, yeah. At some point, my wife decided that Arrow was no longer about superheroes. That's true. That, that it was all just a, a soap opera for geeks. Oh God, yeah, yeah. And um, and the Flash is getting that way. Too. Yeah, so I think they kind of already there. They've kind of always been that way, right? I mean, Battlestar Galactica is, was definitely space opera. It was just relationships. Ones, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just relationships that. But there's a point where you go from world. drama to soap opera, right. you know. And it's sort of like, so it's like, will he, will Felicity and Arrow get back together, or won't they? <laughs> Find out next week. Well, they will, we'll and then they will break up again at the season finale. Yeah, because <laughs> you because that's the way the Bible was written. There's sexual tension between these two characters, and you can only maintain it by, you know. But yeah. I remember a writer talking about Smallville, you know, the the will they won't they of Clark and, and Lana for the first seven years. He's like, yeah, once we got them together in like season five, we had to break them up again because there was no tension. Yeah. <laughs> the, that show was so ridiculous to me because uh, in, at least when I was going to high school, if you were um, a really incredibly good looking dude with a ripped abs and all this stuff there was no way you were not a popular person <laughs> it just didn't work that way in high school so what you were saying is you were popular i was definitely not popular but if i had looked <laughs> like the kid who was playing clark kent i think i would have been very popular <laughs> well he became popular in in the final year of high school he, he joined the football team briefly but who are we talking i've about heard with dean kane right no 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 uh, that's, no, no, that's uh the kid, oh, Tom Welling. Dean Cain is Tom Welling. But, but, okay, so Dean Cain's super popular, and now he's doing, what, Sci-Fi Channel Originals, right? Yeah. He is yeah. also Supergirl's stepfather. What's that, like a three-hour part every six months? Yeah, it's something like that. Well, this must be a recent thing, because I know he's not always been very popular since Lois and Clark. Yeah. So, uh, he just shows up on Supergirl every once in a while. Yeah, I, I used to see him in a lot of sci fi movies. Not that we're getting far afield. <laughs> yeah. Not that we're getting far afield. Hey, well, let's bring it back with uh, I've heard from Kelly that you've been watching The Mist, Matt. Yes, I. Field uh, report. It's like a fan. It sort of sucks and blows at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's well. The thing is, it's not scary at all. Uh, I saw a comment that somebody would say they're really enjoying the monsters, which don't exist. Right. It's like there's there, instead of having like you're out there and there's actually creepy things to be scared of, you have these sort of unbelievable relationships taking place between a lot of anonymous characters whom you can't tell apart and don't really want to. They're very disinteresting. Um, it's, it's harmless to watch as long as you're reading a book and like, let it just play and then stop it. And watch <laughs> the I, I, it's really, um, they build it up to be about the Stephen King horror and otherness on the commercials. And then the story is like, they show the mist like once an episode. I don't know. I really not. I, I couldn't recommend it to anybody. But, you know. Yeah, Kelly said that too. Uh, I'm probably so. still going to continue to record it and uh, watch an episode every now and again. But on the other hand, I'm doing the same thing with Riverdale. <laughs> don't talk about soap opera. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like the way Ms. Grundy looks just like she did in the comics. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, 
I, uh, there are a couple things that have come out that are probably worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the American release has happened for the latest book in Charlie Strauss's laundry series, The Delirium Brief. It would be very hard to pick this book up and read it through as a standalone. It's almost like you have to go back seven or eight books all the way back to the Atrocity Archives and read this from the beginning. I don't want to do any spoilers, but where this ends up is, in many ways, you could predict it if you follow the logic of his writing, but it's also fairly horrific. So okay. Well worth a read, but you can't sort of take it out of, just pull it out of the air and pick it up and enjoy it as if you'd been following the whole series from the beginning. But on the other hand, those books are really good too. Some of them, like I think the Fuller Memorandum was one of my top Lovecraftian novels of all time. So well worth a look. Okay, now another thing that came out, uh, I haven't got it yet, uh, my uh, CD version, but the audio book of The Haunter of the Dark by the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, uh, their latest uh, Dark Adventures radio theater production is now available to purchase. Um, and all of those have been great. Um, I didn't care for the last one so much, but they've all been uh, enjoyable diversions. We're going to have those guys on in two weeks. That's great, because another thing they just put out, there it's out for pre-order right now, is a complete audiobook of Lovecraft's fiction with original music. Uh, the readers are uh, Sean Brainy and Andrew Lehman. And they all have they have nicely expressive voices, and it's got um, original music. Uh, let's see here is by uh, the the text is S. T. Joshi's corrected text. Uh, it's Troy Sterling Nice. Uh, oh, love nice. That being composer. Yeah, he's a good composer. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's like 50 hours of listening. They, you can't buy it on CD. It'll be on like too many CDs, but it will be available for download or else you can buy it and they'll send you a uh, thumb drive. And the thumb drive is very cool looking. It's a collectible thing too. Um, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I want to spend the money. I, I promised myself I'd start cutting back and Shit my like new that. Vic, my new Victrola that my son bought me for Christmas, it it's got everything. It's got a spot where you can put in. This is a multi listening. It's it. You've seen the picture, uh, Kelly. It, it's got it's got this kind of old fashioned look to it. Yeah, that's very cool. LP. I, and, I didn't realize that it had a USB slot in it too, though. That's awesome. You know, then the trick is to be like, I've, I've got, I don't know, umpteen copies of these stories that I've read umpteen times. Do I really need an audiobook version? So I've never, heard, no. <laughs> I've never heard Sean read, but he's got a really cool deep voice. But I've heard Andrew read several, and he's really great to listen to. Yeah, I'm, I, I think this will be a great purchase. I'm just... When, God, when, man, will you show some restraint? <laughs> the, the problem is with such beautifully produced stuff, it's like, you know, do, can you afford another copy? Uh, it's like when Centipede Press came out with this um, collection of Clark Ashton Smith's Averroi stories. Yeah. It's in medieval France. And I've been waiting a long while to have a wonderful collection of those all together. I mean, I but I, but it's costs 170 bucks. If I think it's the cheapest version you can get, if it's unsigned. I have all the stories. You can even read them online. I would love to own it, but I can't afford to keep bu buying the same stories over and over again. Yeah, and then the the other issue I have is that. It's not practical to read. It's huge. Right, right. That's that's what I got. I got, I got Masters of the Weird Tale, Lovecraft. And yeah. All the photographs of Lovecraft in one book with no annotations. Fine, but all the stories are in this main book, and I swear when I open it up, I can't breathe. It like weighs down on my stomach. I can't get air <laughs> in my body. If this thing fell on your head, you 
die. You, you, you can't lift them up. No. As you get older. I mean, these are great books to own when you're in your 20s and 30s. But of course, you can't afford them then. Oh. I was saying, when you, get, when you get, start to get in your 60s like me, it's like, how can I lift these things up? <laughs> anyway, this looks like a great item to purchase if you want an audio version of these books. These guys are consummate professionals. The composer is wonderful. They have samples you can listen to on the website. You guys make sure you think of some great questions to ask these guys in two weeks. I'm really looking forward to having them on the show. Where do you get your ideas? Where, yeah, exactly. I'll let you ask that one. <laughs> There's a tree in my backyard. It grows ideas. Um, They're not so I thought it would be kind of neat to briefly talk about our scariest horror movies, what, what we consider to be the scariest horror movies or scariest and scariest books. I'd like to start with books. Uh, did you guys put any thought into that? I did. I thought this was a difficult question because it, it depends on, for me at least, it depends on when I read these stories. That's um, true. You know, I read The Shining when I was 12, and that book terrified me. And I would say that's my pick, but I, I think I've probably read things that were scarier than that since then. But as an adult, those things don't scare me anymore. I think I'm asking as an adult because as an adult, well, mo you know, many adults, you're obviously not as scared of things as you are when you're a kid or hopefully. Right. Um, so yeah, maybe I should have been more specific, but that's what I had in mind. Well, I'll throw The Shining out there. I think that is a really, really scary book. Since we're on a Stephen King kick, I'll throw Revival out there. Oh, that's true. Because yeah. that, what, what, what scares me in horror stories is if it's something that could conceivably be real. Yes. And we don't know what the afterlife is going to be like, I mean, if, if there is one. Some of us believe there won't be one at all. And it could be like that. Yeah, why, if there is an afterlife, what what makes us think it's going to be Paradise. shiny and good, you know? <laughs> it may be hell for everybody. Yeah, so. Um, well, I'll throw out a couple. Um, and... I don't know if I said this, but throw out short stories too, if you like, or novellas. But The Man in the Picture by Susan Hill, I think is a very, very creepy uh, horror story. Some very, very effective scenes in this book. And if you haven't read it, she's the same. She, she wrote, um, uh, shoot, what is the other one? I just blanked on it. Oh, The Woman in Black, which was recently made into a, I thought, pretty good movie with the kid from um, the Harry Potter movies. Um, so pick up the man in the picture, Susan Hill, and tell me if you you agree or not. I like the way it starts, too, with two, two guys in front of a roaring fireplace in the middle of winter, and one tells the other a story, um, and, and it proceeds from there. Um, the other one that I think kind of ties into revival, Rick, is uh, Harlan Ellison's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. I thought that story was pretty terrifying the first time I read it. No? Everybody disagrees? No, it was, it, it was pretty terrifying when, you know, back then. You know, and, yeah, it, it, it was yeah, very powerful. Was good, because, yeah. yeah. And you know, realizing that they're the last people on the planet and they're being tortured. I I have to read it. So, oh, you haven't read it? I haven't. Only Ellison I've really read has been the uh, the sequel he wrote to Robert Bloch's A Toy for Juliet, which was the Jack the Ripper story. Right. Okay. And of course, um, in which I've mentioned several times, it's a short story by Stephen King. I think that's pretty creepy. 
So anybody else want to throw anything out there? Well, Recommendations to people? Okay, well, the problem is I don't really find uh, fiction that's scary. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I got scared reading... That's why I've only got three recommendations, yeah. You know, I got very scared reading Winged Death when I was a, a boy. That's because a giant wasp flew in the room and buzzed around the room. Well, in the middle of while I was reading it, it was about one in the morning. It terrified the hell out of me. But, it, I mean, <laughs> nonfiction books scare me much more. <laughs> there, there's a book uh, called Ordinary Men about uh, a group in, of German soldiers who were made to participate in the Holocaust and they uh, first didn't like it and then they took to it and then they got pretty good at it. And the end of the story was if this group of men who are just regular people could be made to do this thing, who couldn't? And that just they, has given me no end of disquiet over the years. That's a lot scarier to me than um, even Stephen King. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I see what you mean. Well, with as far as none. What was that? Fiction. Good. As far as nonfiction goes, without Thomas Ligotti's, um, sorry, I just blanked on the title. Um, the uh, conspiracy against the human race. Conspiracy against the human race. Yes. Yeah. So. P P yeah. Danny? Yeah. There, so there's this this tr in traditional horrors. One of the it's a short story by Donald Walheim called Mimic, and it's it's the basis for the Guillermo del Toro movie series, but it really has very little to do with, the, you know, they took the name and a basic premise, but it's not basically this, this guy who rents an apartment and he go, he moves in and hardly anybody ever sees him. And he spends like a whole year there. He has all his food delivered. He never leaves. And finally, you know, at in spring, they, they, they haven't heard from him in, in weeks and they break down the door and he's emerging from a cocoon and he's transformed into something with wings and uh, he flies out mm -hmm. of the window. And what happens next is the terrifying part is all these things on the rooftops try to catch him. Things that look like chimneys and television antennas, lawn chairs, you know, They're, the whole city is just populated with things pretending to be other things. Oh, wow. Who wrote that? Don Walheim. So. Did you get another AOL email there, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Then it would say you've got mail. So and, my uh, Don Warnheim was famous for being the editor of Ace Paperbacks. Right. Science fiction. When, uh, right. People Isn't of it, my and Joe's generation were going. Right. Isn't he? It's Daw, Daw was his imprint, right? Don Lee Walheim? Yeah, he, and then he, he went from Ace to DAW. Yeah. And then from, you know, it's not traditionally considered a horror novel, but. It's her, in my mind, it's horrific. It's the Lord of the Flies. Yeah. I just, you know, talk about quick degeneration of human cultures and, and societal norms. Uh, and the, the establishment of a, a totally horrific culture. And to show you how a writer can change things around, this is something obscure I'll tell you about Lord of the Flies. It's from a Jules Verne novel called The Long Vacation, which deals yes, with the same, yes. same premise. Right. Kids get marooned on this island, and at the point where they're about to split up, and it gets interesting, pirates come on the island and they got to unite against them. And it's just a typical boy's adventure. But, it, but William Golden changed it into this horrific scenario.
Right. He just said, you know, what what if they, he looked at it and said, what if they went in, in the direction that Vern was about to go? Yeah. Uh, that's very interesting, Rick. Did he mention it ever in an interview that that was sort of part of his? Yeah, I, there's a book. Uh, there's a book on Jules Verne which has an essay by him. That's and, fascinating. And he acknowledges. That's fascinating. But I mean, Anyone the, the Jules Verne story is is really forgettable. It's you know a pot boiler that he could write in his sleep for his adventure. But it shows you how a minor work can lead to a greater work. Anyone want to throw any other horror books or short stories out? Now we can move on to scary horror movies, scariest horror movies, which might that, be this is a little easier. An easier discussion because yeah, they have those visual media and the music and the shifting scenes and art direction that can all lead to a very scary experience uh, that might not come across in the same visceral way on the page. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So let's just knock it off the park. The Mist is a mediocre movie, but I can't watch the last five minutes. Uh, I agree. Is that scary, though? I mean, it is, um, it's a rough watch, but is it scary? That, that last five minutes, I just cannot, I cannot do it. As a, a parent, I cannot watch that. Screw you, Matt Carpenter. <laughs> Alligator people. <laughs> I'm afraid every time I see the words now. When, when scare, the horror movies which had something that might be real. I, I mean, granted, I saw this as a teenager. The Tingler was Vincent Price. Scared the heck out of me. Did you get to see it in a theater that was? No, I, 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 I actually, I actually saw the commercials for it when they had that, uh, when I was like about six or seven or something. But I didn't see it till like I was about thirteen or fourteen. But just the concept of this, this, this thing living in your back, which lives on fear, because yeah. you have no. No explanation why you get that tingle. And the way it ends, it has one of the best last lines in a horror movie that I've ever heard. I have never forgotten that a lot. What about um, Trilogy of Terror? Oh my Trilogy God. Of Terror. So, <laughs> you know, I will, sell, I will tell everybody that Return of the Living Dead is, you know, it's funny as all hell, right? But even today, the frigging tar man scares the crap out of me. Yeah. That is a, that's a creepy character. I, I saw that in, I was in ocean city, Maryland in the, in the, on the in the, the swamp house watching that alone. And, you know, I had to sleep with the lights on for a couple of days. And yeah, even now, yeah, you know, I watch it. I don't want my kids to see that, but when I walk upstairs after I seen that movie, I, I, I run upstairs. <laughs> that character just freaks me out. I will throw out Jaws. Um, oh yeah, I oh, think yeah. that is still a scary movie. Uh, you know, I told the story that my mom and my sister thought it would be great to take six-year-old Kelly to see Jaws when it first came out, and it really <laughs> ruined me for being on the water and all of that stuff. But then I took my sister to the. Um, 40th anniversary showing of it in the theater again last year or the year before and she was still terrified and I've seen it about a million times since then it's probably my favorite movie but uh, right off the bat that scene with the girl who decides to go skinny dipping and then she gets you know yanked down under the water a couple of times and then she's yanked back and forth that is so scary because you can't see anything but her and her reaction yeah, uh, and I think that's uh, you know when when you're a kid you have these uh, these various gross out ways or discussions where you're talking about what's the worst way to die you know fire or whatever I think uh, shark attack is probably my choice for worst way to die. Well, when I was growing up, the equivalent scene of that and you used you used to have this thing in New York called Million Dollar Movie and it would show movies over and over again. Joe Pulver would remember it. If you ever saw the original Rodan. 
Oh, yes. There's a scene yeah. early on where these Japanese soldiers in this flooded mine and they're getting pulled under by something. It, 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 it turns out to be uh, giant bugs eventually. But that scared the heck out, even though you, you, don't, you don't see anything, but it's like this is same thing. You're seeing getting killed one by, you're getting sucked under the water one by one by well, something. Had, the, the original Frankenstein, before it was edited, you know, we always talk about how in a lot of American mainstream horror for many years, children were essentially untouchable. And in the original Frankenstein, a little girl gets killed by the monster. In, in the most innocent of ways, it, it, the, the monster doesn't realize what he's doing. But still, you wonder if that had been allowed to be explored, what would American horror have been like? I still find that scene, scene incredibly unnerving. Well, then we had the um, Hayes Code after that, which restricted in what you could show. And in fact, it's, it's little known, but there was a period of about a year or two where there was a ban on horror movies in the United States. It's like around 36, 37. That they, they, the studios what, all agreed not to make any horror movies. Really? Hmm. That's fair. I did not know. The reason I know that is that there, it, uh, I was reading something. It was uh, Bela Lugosi. And during that period, he had to um, make serials where he was a spy because he couldn't work in horror movies. And in fact, I remember now where I read it, Ramsey Campbell in his Ancient Images where he has that fictional call off the ghosty movie. That's the reason he, he has it made in the UK. That's the reason he did it. He said that neither call off and all the ghosts could find work in horror movies. So they, they go to they go to the UK to make this fictional horror movie. Okay, well there are two um I think completely brilliant Hitchcock movies that I find I still find very terrifying. Um, and of course, one is Psycho. Uh, I, I, you know, even today, um, watching it, I will become unnerved. And it was just about intolerably scary. Uh, when I was uh, a little kid, when it would actually, I think by then it was appearing on TV. And so I'd be watching it by myself in the living room and no one else would be around. It just scared the heck out of me. I remember the first time I saw it was just about unbearable. Um, but then the other movie I think that is so brilliantly scary is uh, The Birds. Yeah. Uh, I still find that to be one of the most magnificent horror movies ever made. My wife is terrified of that movie. And that is something which could happen in the back of your mind. You know, that all these creatures that we live with we silly turn on us. You mean like in Squirm or Frogs or Kingdom of the Ants? Day of the Animals. Day of the Animals. Uh, what was it? But not a, they're not as well done as uh, <laughs> Swarm. Oh man, Frog, I just Frogs, saw that again Frogs recently. Was, <laughs> Frogs was the Ray Milland movie, right? Well, yes. Night of, okay, Night of the Leapus. Okay. Oh, Night of the Leapus That's with right. the Forrest Kelly, right? I admit it. I like that movie. Uh, was it Attack of the Killer Shrews? <laughs> Mike, what about you? You haven't said we anything. The birds. Oh, I'll throw out a couple. Um, the first one I'll throw out kind of sounds like, and, and to some degree it does, belong in in the kind of the scream category, you know, kind of a teen horror film. But I thought it was very effective. A movie called Jeepers Creepers. I don't know if you guys have seen it. But, and I, I really don't want to 
give any spoilers here because it's very effective, but there's a scene where a certain character is told that something is going to happen to him. Something <laughs> really bad is going to happen to him. And the person that's saying this is never wrong, you know, and you know exactly what's going to happen to this guy. It's just, that was pretty creepy. And the end, end of that movie was very, very creepy and well done as well. So is, Was Ray Wise in that? Was he? I don't I think, think, well, so. I think he was in the sequel, at least. Yeah, he's in the sequel. Well, I don't remember Jeepers Creepers 2, but I sure remember the first one. Yeah. So, um, there's a movie called Lake Mungo which is a faux documentary. Yeah. Which was really effective. You saw that, Kelly? Yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah. I thought that was really good. Um, I've only ever seen Event Horizon once because it disturbed me <laughs> that much that I didn't want to watch it again. And I watched it. The first time I watched it, I was probably 27, 28 at the most. So... I have a soft spot for sci-fi horror or horror set in outer space. I, I really dig that for some reason. I don't think Event Horizon is a particularly good movie, but I think it's got some great parts in it. And it is, it's is—it's got some very scary parts in it. Yeah. Uh, it Follows, I thought, was very effective. So there's just a few. Anybody else? I want to go back to um, the stories we were talking about. Maybe somebody can help me with this. I think it was a Ramsey Campbell short story, and it's about a guy who um, he's driving along with his wife who is asleep in the car, and he pulls off into a rest area. Is this ringing any bells? And it's a deserted rest area. It's not deserted. There are a bunch of cars parked in the parking lot, and um, he goes, uses the restroom, comes out and he notices that the cars are all covered in dust. Is this ringing any bells for anybody? I'm getting no, close to I revealing like to read this. No, but I'm getting creeped out. So keep. I'm, I'm getting. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to tell you what happens because it's very yeah, no, creepy and scary. But I thought it was Ramsey Campbell. Maybe I'm off. Maybe one of the listeners. What was it? Uh, I was that. wondering. I don't remember the story that well, but it was a story sort of like that by Brian Lumley called "A Thing About Cars." I don't think it was Lumley. I'm, I'm almost positive it was not Lumley. Well, if you know what, what uh, Kelly's talking about and you're listening to this now or later, uh, email me, lovecrafteasying at gmail.com. Was, Kelly. was Kelly was the horror more Lockean than Lovecraftian? The horror is human. Yes, uh, that's still in the Lumley story. It's human. Maybe I should look for that then. For some reason, I thought it was called They Only Come Out at Night or something like that. But uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm mixing up a bunch of stories, I think. I'm, I'm thinking of a Dennis Etch Etchinson um, short story that's got a similar premise. So. Hmm. But I can't remember much about that one right now. Uh. So we're closing well, I mean, that. I'll, I'll, yeah. mention, I'll mention the suspense. It's more a suspense movie than a horror movie, but sure. Duel, which was uh, Steven yeah. Spielberg's first movie he directed, uh, TV movie about uh, Dennis uh, Weaver getting chased by the crazy truck driver. That was one of the most frightening movies I ever saw. Because you could easily be on the road and have that happen. Yeah. Even more so today. Yeah. And someone will videotape it while you're while it's happening. Well, I, I did have a friend who um, had got into sort of like a uh, would you call it a road altercation or a difference of opinion on the road with some truckers, and apparently this trucker spoke with some friends of his, and they got like. One truck in front of him, one truck behind him, and one to the side, so he couldn't go anywhere. And they made him drive very fast for a good long while. He couldn't extricate himself from the situation. And he said he was just really terrified. 
you know, so that something like that actually did happen to someone that I knew. And eventually he was able to come to an exit and just get off. Kelly, does the title, They Look Like Humans, ring a bell? Someone in the the live texting stream has mentioned that. No, but I have found, um, I'm thinking this is what it is. You mentioned Dennis Etchison, so I've been researching, and I'm finding a story called It Only Comes Out at Night, a highway yes. rest area is a journal house for awaiting travelers. That is what I'm thinking of. Hey, I beat Pete and Rick to the punch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have, oh, yeah. It's good. Yep. Yeah, it is good. Um, I'm just I'm just gonna take my alligator people movie and go home. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for Matt to say that's a crock one more time. <laughs> well, even though this was more of a fun movie as a kid, but the, the, the way it ended, the original thing was James Onessa's The Monster, the Howard Hawks black and white version. The ending where the reporter is saying, watch the skies, freaked me out as a kid. They were going to have, you know, because we were having, uh, at least when I was growing up, the UFO stuff was very uh, prevalent. I, I had a similar experience to a story. There's a kid who, uh, a spaceship, I forget what it was called, a spaceship crashed in his backyard. Like his father went to investigate it and came back, and his personality was changed. Invaders from Mars. Invaders from Mars. Yeah. The original or the remake? The original. I never saw the remake. The remake yeah. is good too. Yeah. It is. It is good. The original. The original kind of looks cheap when you see it as an as as an adult. But, but I seem seem to recall that the end was that the beginning was happening. Yeah, yeah. that was. I liked that a lot. That was what creeped me out when I was a kid. Yeah. It's one of those classics, oh, it's a dream. But then it's it is it? Dun dun dun. <laughs> hey, when you're when you're like less than ten years old, that stuff works real good. <laughs> right. Well, well unfortunately if you see that movie, they, they, they use the same shot of the Martians running through the tunnel. Over and over again. They're over and over again. Yeah. That's why, that's why it doesn't, you know, when, when you see it as a kid, all these, these crazy marshes, they look wonderful. And then when you watch it later, when you can notice reuse scenes over again, the same fat Martian was running down this corridor over and over again. Same fat Martian. <laughs> well, we're closing in on Necronomicon, guys. Four weeks. That's hard to believe. <sighs> yes. I will I be flying in Wednesday night and I'll be around Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I will be flying in Wednesday night, I believe it is. It's sometime on Wednesday. And I will be there through Sunday. So come say hi if you if you see me. Oh, and they added a, a Saturday night they added bar trivia, apparently hosted by me, but I don't know which bar it's at yet. <laughs> I, um, they just randomly added you. No, I I had asked to do it again. Oh, okay. It's not core programming. So uh, I'm gonna get there Wednesday early afternoon or late morning, and okay. I'm probably gonna. What I usually do in that circumstance is after I check in, I walk up to the art show, and so that's where I'll probably be all of Wednesday. Well, let, let me ask you this, Matt: Are you? up on this newfangled um, texting thing? Because last convention, you weren't. Um, if you can send it through AOL email. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get a hold of Matt. I'm texting him. He never returns a text. And so finally, I get it, you know. Well, he's, he's, you know. He just, he's not getting them. Or he's, he's getting them, and, and he's looking at it, and it's like he's like, yeah, it's Mike. Forget it. I, I, I can receive texts, but I, I, I've never texted back. You see, see, it's not just me. It's famous people, too. This is, some of us do not have the finger dexterity to type all these uh, wonderful messages. Well, now, see, I, I've gotten over that, Rick. I can text back emojis. 
I don't have to write a word. Don't you send me an emoji. <laughs> Little pictures of alligators and stuff. You want to meet me down at 1 o'clock for lunch? I get this emoji that's supposed to mean yes, I guess. <laughs> big go. middle finger. Or no, so, yeah, big middle finger. I'll take that as a no. Well, Kelly gave that to us all. Last couple months ago, my daughter had a poop emoji themed birthday party. Um, what? Where? Yeah. Raising but, her right, Pete. But makes by you the wonder way, what kind of father that kid has. Yeah. By the way, Pete, are you ever going to write a book or a short story called Lord of the Reanimated? Oh, you know, I hadn't thought of that. That's he a is good now. title, I've seen looking at, you know, uh, under your name. Yeah, I know. Huh. I could do that. I've been wanting to write. Well, I, I've been wanting to write another story about a character. Go ahead and, and copyright that real quick, Rick. Yeah. Then he'll have to pay you. Yeah. <laughs> that might work. By, for me. by the way, since we're talking about Necronomicon, they did add me to the Robert E. Howard panel. There you go. I figured they would if you just said something. And, and they added me to none of the panels, so it's all good. Yeah, Niels was like, "You're only on." Two panels. We need to add you some more. I was thinking, why? <laughs> I told him to. I told him that you love panels and you wouldn't want to do anything else. Well, it's, it would be. It's nice if they send you an email that they've added you to another panel, rather than yeah. you the book and use. Yeah. Why well, ended up not being added? To, it just didn't work out uh, on both ends for me to be added to any other panels. That means there's a lot of time for me to just hang out. So, two or three is about max for me. Yeah, I, I get a little tired. And it takes a lot out of, out of you doing these doing those panels. I mean, it's a lot of energy. It's also bad when you're on a panel which you shouldn't be on, which happened last year to me. It was small press, and and it was kind of funny. I was told it wasn't going to be. I said, well, I could discuss small magazines, and we're not going to go into that. And when I got there late, I thought I had gone to it with the wrong panel because everybody was talking about the history of pulp magazines. Nice. Uh. Well, I'm on small press, and I'm moderating another one, which I can't remember right now. What's that look for, Pete? Oh, I was just remembering that um, Mallory was telling me like the day before the schedule came out that she's not going to make Necronomicon, Mallory O'Mara. And then I looked at the schedule and she was moderating all the film panels. <laughs> they may have asked her special to come because of uh, she got a certain amount of notoriety. Yep. So it's not a bad thing that she's coming. It's a good thing. Well, I don't, I don't know that she is or not. Oh, well, that's a bad thing then. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, next week it's just us, and the week after that we're talking to uh, the guys from the HP Lovecraft Historical Society. So right. that should be a lot of fun. Yeah. So thanks everybody for listening, and we will be with you next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike.